Worst of all time. The true story of Regency actor Robert Coates. So uh, we're right in the middle of making a video documentary, but frankly, at this point, it's an open question whether or not it's ever going to get finished. Docs aren't cheap to make, and so far, we've yet to find a suitable backer. So at Janet's suggestion, Janet's my partner, we decided to make an audio doc or a, a blog, I suppose, a record of the making of our story. We have a huge backlog of footage still to edit. Hours and hours of conversation with Mr. Coates himself plus supplementary material from family members and the people he worked with, even a few anonymous audience members who watched him perform. Very rich material. In the meantime, listeners can keep abreast of our progress by listening to this audio doc or blog, whatever you want to call it. Fortunately, I've kept a journal during the filming, so I'll be referring to that a lot. And then there's the footage itself, whose files, thankfully, Linda has faithfully stored and dated. Might as well start when I first meet Mr. Coates. We're in London, England, and it's 1825. You heard me, 1825. How it got to be 1825 and why Robert Coates, I'll get to later. But first, a brief setup, as promised. Janet told me I should try to deliver this in the present tense because that would make the listeners more engaged. I guess we'll see. So, dear listener, try to imagine me standing in a small but elegant house in the fashionable district of London, 34 Craven Street, the Strand, to be specific. Standing on my left is Linda Henderson, my camera operator, and my friend since university. She's really good at bridge, and even better as a videographer. On my right, slightly out of breath, is Janet Singleton, who humorously likes to call herself multi-talented, but it's actually pretty true. She looks after makeup, Lighting, sound, and even research. Actually, she loves doing research, and she's always reading. We also share a house and bed, which only makes sense if you're trying to make a go of it in Toronto. And then there's me, Fred Pruitt, documentary film director. Linda tightens the screws on her tripod and says to me, You do realize Robert Coates is a pretty darn unreliable narrator. Well, yeah, that goes without saying. But he should be entertaining. I'm holding a cup of tea in my hand. Not because I like tea, God no, but because in Regency London, that seems to be the boisson du jour. I put down my cup. Honestly, Linda, if half the stuff Janet told us about this guy's true, this footage is going to be gold. Sundance material for sure. England's worst actor. Is that really our working title? For now. I move closer so Mr. Coates can hear me. He sits in an ornate Regency-style morning chair. Uh, can we get you anything, sir? Another cushion? Yeah, I'm most comfortable, Mr. Pruitt. Uh, how could I not be in my own lodgings and with a cup of the Viscount's tea in my hand? Viscount, right. <laughs> Pretty interesting fellow from what I hear. But mostly we're interested in your story, Mr. Coates. So just relax and tell things in your own words. Whose other words should I choose? What can I do but smile and bite my tongue? I get the feeling there's going to be a lot of tongue biting in this project. I turn to Janet. Makeup okay? Would have been nice to remove some of his makeup. Janet rolls her eyes. I think it's her favorite gesture. But it seems Mr. Coates is extremely particular about his personal appearance. Actors, you know. I used to do a little of acting. Uh, until I found out there were hundreds of others better at it than me, and most of them were out of work. But but what about the hat? No way we're going to get him to remove the hat. He might as well be wearing a goddamn sombrero. I particularly like the foot-long white feather sticking up in the front. Very cinematic. Can we at least get him to pull it back a bit so his face isn't completely in shadow? Janet likes to complain that she's underpaid. I remind her that we actually did make money in our last project. Not much, but some. And what about this time-traveling gig we've stumbled upon? How can you put a price tag on that? I'm sure Linda feels undervalued too. Anyone in the biz, probably. As for me, turns out my main job is to keep everyone in my crew happy. It's all about public relations, not film directing. And living with my sound and light techie only makes things more complicated. 
Anyway, I'm straying from the central story. Back to London we go. Mr. Coates, shall we begin? It's important for you to picture just how Robert Coates puts down his teacup. He does it with precision. In a way, I can't imagine anyone from our century doing. Not anyone who lives in Roncesvalles, anyway. He does it as if he's handling a precious artifact. And maybe he is, for all I know. Then, what Mr. Coates likes to do is cross one leg over the other, setting into prominent view his diamond-studded knee buckle. It takes a moment for him to get settled, as if he's looking for the chair's sweet spot. Then he brushes back a strand of his hair, which I'm pretty sure he's dyed to hide the gray. How do I look? Tremendous, Mr. Coates. I turn back to Linda. Final check. Battery fully charged? Hundred percent. What about those diamonds? Are they going to be a problem? I'll just shoot him from the waist up. I do not mean to disoblige you, uh, Mr. Pruitt, but before we begin, uh, the purpose... At this point, Robert Coates is waving his hand in the air, making a small spiral like some third-rate actor searching for a line. Uh, the, the purpose of this... Uh, what is the term you used? Uh, documentary? Just so. The purpose of this documentary is... Uh, what, precisely? I swallow a sigh and keep smiling. Uh, the purpose is in the word, Mr. Coates, to document your life, to make a record of your achievements, your passions, your best and worst memories, what you would like the world to remember about you. Uh, you speak of creating a document, sir, yet I see among the three of you neither paper nor pen. That is the beauty of it, Mr. Coates. With the device Miss Henderson, Linda, is operating, everything is recorded automatically. Your words, your gestures, your resplendent attire. I must have chosen the right word, because at this point, Robert Coates breaks his pose and switches one leg over the other and smiles at me. And I may hope that all my reminiscences will then be immortalized in a book? A book? Oh, cripes. That was the farthest thing from my mind. A book? Possibly. We'll definitely look into it. Remind me, Linda. Oh, I will, Fred. After all, Mr. Pruitt... What man of letters, in which category some would deign to include me, would not wish to have his thoughts inscribed on the page for posterity? <laughs> Can you think of any who would not? No, you've got me there, Mr. Coates. I offer a big directorial smile at this point, which on most sets would clearly communicate it was time to move on. But Mr. Coates is either oblivious or impervious to such body language. The point I'd like you to keep in mind, Mr. Coates, is that Miss Henderson's camera here can record much more than mere words. Mere words, Mr. Pruitt? Whatever were words, mere. Point taken, Mr. Coates. And we value your words very highly indeed. But in addition to your actual words, with Linda's camera, we'll be able to document the way in which you say them. Your cadence, your tone, your accent, everything. Later, complete strangers, friends too, of course, will be able to hear and see you speak just as if they were in the same room with you. You jest, sir. And when we're done, I'll show you the fruits of our labor. You'll be able to watch your own words and image reproduced just as they were when we interviewed you. Works of the devil, surely. Now that's a joke I can appreciate. I point to Linda. Only if the devil has taken on female form. Not in the least funny, Mr. Pruitt. If not the devil, the, the work of the French, I wager. Possibly Lavoisier. You've heard of Lavoisier, Miss Anderson? Linda's an amazing videographer. But when it comes to general knowledge, let me put it this way. She isn't the first one you choose to have on your pub quiz team. Janet, however, is a different story. Lavoisier, French chemist. I believe he was guillotined in the end. Alas, so. Or perhaps it is the work of Mr. Davy and his galvanism. I wouldn't put it past him. Disgraceful showman, but quite clever, I suppose. The ladies used to swoon while watching Davy's experiments. God, I think. Did that word really exist outside the world of books? Swoon? And sometimes sent him their calling cards. Oh? Wrapped in undergarments. <laughs> Are you all right, Linda? 
I wonder what Mr. Coates makes of all this. We profess to be American, so I think he makes allowance for our foreign accents and questionable dress and manners. All the same. I was once invited to one of Mr. Davies' lectures. I watch as Mr. Coates pulls a handkerchief from his pocket, wiping from his shoulder something only he can see. I can't see anything. Uh, did not bother to attend. Next, uh, maybe to signal his reflections about the man have come to an end, Mr. Coates opens a snuff box. I believe the man is dead now. God, snuff! Can you believe it? But back to the story. <clears throat> Mr. Coates, what is it they say? Time waits for no man. Uh, tempest uh, fugit. <laughs> exactly. So I beg you to just trust the process. From your point of view, it will be simply as though we are having a conversation. You may pause at any time. You see that little red light flashing? That will be a sign to you that we are recording, documenting. Only please don't look at the light. Try to forget that Miss Henderson is there. And that device on the end of the boom that Janet is holding, that's meant to record your words so we can hear them better. You should ignore that as well. Should I speak louder? Your voice is perfect, Mr. Coach, just the way it is. I've been told so by many, but dare not profess it myself. <laughs> you have a magnificent voice, sir, and stories to match, I'm sure. I do have one or two anecdotes I might share. Um, are you quite sure, Mr. Pruitt, uh, that we have never met before? Well, what can I say to that? I ignored the question. Rolling. So, Mr. Coates, I understand you were born in the West Indies. Indeed, sir. Born to parents Alexander and Dorothy on the island of Antigua. But your father was actually born in America, is that correct? In the British colonies, yes. Even with just one studio light, which in retrospect I'm sorry we bothered bringing, the room is broiling. I have to keep wiping sweat from my forehead. And yet you've spent most of your life in England. That makes you very cosmopolitan. Uh, forgive me, Mr. Pruitt. Uh, Cosmo what? Well-traveled. A man of the world. Ah, I see. Some might say so. Uh, Janet has assured me that Mr. Coates was famous for his conversational skills. But so far, it's like pulling teeth to get much more than a yes or no out of him. Why don't we start with your time on Antigua? What was it like growing up there? Little to tell, Mr. Pruitt. Uh, put succinctly, it was hot. <laughs> Sugar cane everywhere, as well as Negro workers and servants. Here, Mr. Coates smiles and drums his fingers across his armrest. Not a good sign. I stayed only until I was eight, then off to England and boarding school. Before leaving, we show Mr. Coates a small sample of our filming. Linda points to her monitor. That's you, Mr. Coates. It cannot be. It is, Mr. Coates. No. I assure you, Mr. Coates, don't you recognize your lodgings, your clothes? I'm so small. All this started two weeks ago when Linda comes traipsing through our front door with a camera slung over her shoulder. Where the hell have you been? We were supposed to be in Mississauga half an hour ago to interview what's-his-name. I've been to London, Fred. To visit the Queen! What? London! What are you talking about? When? London, Ontario? England! Don't I wish. That would mean we had a budget. I snort and begin to zip up my coat, but it gets stuck. A predictor for how I expect the day to go as a whole. Or maybe I mean H-O-L-E, because that's what a day's filming is often like. Zippers, microphones, lights, everything in the universe destined to break mostly sooner than later, and ending up down some black hole. Come on, Linda. Car's in the back. Not so fast, Fred. I have to show you something. Maybe later, Linda. Time to go. Guys, guys, please, you promised to let me show you. Your video camera time machine? Really, Linda? So what? You just power up, go to your menu. Don't touch it, Janet. It's not a toy. Jeez, take it easy. We're not going anywhere till I show you. What the hell, Linda? It's freezing out here. Let's get in the car. But when Linda gets into one of her moods, we have no choice. So we stand there like idiots with tiny pellets of snow blowing in our faces. So, I know how this works for one person, but maybe it has a limited range. 
uh, maybe if you, I don't know, hold on to me or something. <laughs> like Scrooge and the Ghost of Christmas Present. Just do it, okay? So we do it. We link arms and turn our backs to the wind. If it wasn't for the ice pellets, I'd be rolling my eyes. Right. So I was just exploring the menu options. Under the date, time, zone settings, I see there's an option for location. What the hell, I think? Why would I need that? Enough with the explanations, Linda. I'm starting to get frostbite. Anyway, so I scroll through the options and pick one just to see what'll happen. London. Then it's time to test the image quality. So I hit the shutter button and boom! Boom? You're in London? Yes, like this! And before you can snap your fingers, there we are, in the middle of Trafalgar Square. My God. Janet doesn't say anything. I mean, what can a person say? There we are, staring at the freaking National Gallery. I can see red double-decker buses rounding a traffic circle, and the black taxi cabs, everything. And I'm thinking, maybe we won't go bankrupt after all. And then, when it's time to go back, I just set the location button back to Toronto. And voila! And instantly, we're back in the freaking wind and snow. Janet and I just stand there for a good minute, our eyes big and our mouths hanging open. Uh, uh, again. Your wish is my command. And back to London we go, then back to Toronto, then London again, three times in all. What about Paris? May we? Sydney, Australia? Behold! And we do. We're looking out over the harbour and the Sydney Opera House. Holy shit, I remember saying, we were supposed to start filming a documentary about Paul Carson, a famous Canadian Shakespearean actor. So what now, Fred? Well, we can forget about what's his name. And that's how it all starts. Back in Toronto, no one wants to cook, so we order in some Thai. I crack open a beer and pour my co-workers a traditional Chardonnay. So you say you got the camera from Craigslist? Yeah, from some creepy guy over in Parksdale. Creepy how? I don't know. Swarthy. Old. Quite short, now that I think about it. A leprechaun, then. No, Janet, not a leprechaun. <laughs> How do you know? Jesus, Janet. It's hard to believe, isn't it? It's so simple. You just have to scroll down to the date, time, zone settings and pick a location. And you picked London. I'm a closet monarchist, Fred. Didn't you know? I guess memory is a kind of time travel, too. And thinking back to the events of two weeks ago seems just as strange somehow as thinking back to our stay in London two centuries ago. Let me explain. After a little fiddling around with the camera's menu, we discover, to our utter amazement, that not only can we pick a geographical location, we can pick a historical date as well. That was a game changer. We spend the evening reviewing the first day's filming. Technically, the footage is flawless, but the content is disappointing. Mr. Coates remembers very little of his childhood in Antigua, and as far as his English schooling goes, he summarizes his experience as... Quite adequate. Tough interview. Oh, yeah. The only time the man gets excited is when the topic of theatre comes up. It's in London, he explains, that he first becomes exposed to the stage, viewing firsthand some of the greats of the English theatre, including the extraordinary Edmund Keane. What was he like? Magnificent. What exactly made Mr. Keane magnificent? A uh, case of je ne sais quoi, I'm afraid. A certain presence, an indefinable something. Really, Mr. Pruitt, you had to be there. After completing his schooling, Mr. Coates returns to Antigua, where his first order of business is to join the local theatrical society. He shows little interest in the day-to-day -day operations of his father's sugar plantation. That part I get. But the hours he spends rehearsing and performing, including his first experience of Romeo and Juliet, Mr. Coates remembers very fondly. Great, I think. Finally, we're getting somewhere. You played Romeo. I did indeed, Mr. Pruitt. At which point Mr. Coates rises from his chair and explains he has a prior engagement. 
which pretty much puts a wrap on the day's filming. Linda expects every dinner to be followed by dessert, but all we have are wagon wheels, which have been in the freezer for God knows how long. This is no deterrent to Linda, who doesn't even wait for them to thaw before biting into one. We turn on the TV. Jeopardy is on, and Janet keeps answering the questions before the contestants press their buzzers. Not always, but enough to be very annoying. What are the cascades? What are gamma rays? I've always been skeptical about the notion of a sugar high, but watching Linda, I'm having second thoughts, especially after she punches me in the shoulder. Can you believe we have a friggin' time machine, Fred? I nod. I can't decide which woman I most want to ignore. I mean, I thought it was cool enough that we could beam all over the world like that, but to be able to travel through time as well. And again, so simple. Just have to adjust the time date function. I'm so glad Janet made me do that. Thanks, Janet. What is a quaka? Think of the possibilities, Fred. I dodge away from Linda's punch this time. I watch her lick her fingers. Still, I have to say I was a little surprised we started with Robert Coates. I was surprised too. Who is Phil Oakes? I don't think it was Phil Oakes. I think Janet mentioned David Garrick. Right, and I guess we could even have done Shakespeare, and maybe we still will. Right, boss? Who knows? It was a mistake to pat Linda's hand earlier because now I have chocolate all over my fingers. Then, out of the blue, Janet suggests Robert Coates. I'd never even heard of him, the world's worst actor. I mean, what a concept! Well, if we're going for offbeat, Robert Coates is probably our man. I notice the final Jeopardy question has just come up on the screen. In the 15th century BCE, this city was regarded as the capital of the Minoan Empire. Thirty seconds. Good luck. The music countdown has hardly started when Banshee Janet does it again. What is Nosos? There's forty-six thousand dollars, American dollars, that will never fall into our pockets. Damn. We should go. To Nosos? To Antigua. Get the scoop on young Coates firsthand. Linda's in the kitchen looking for another wagon wheel. Antigua's not on the list of locations. I checked, Janet. Well, somewhere close then. There's Kingston, Jamaica, but. What about your GPS? Couldn't you just? Linda returns with her second wagon wheel. She puts a hand on my shoulder as if to say, "Poor Fred, you just don't understand these things." The GPS, Fred, just gives you your current location where you're shooting. You can't set it. Have you tried? Well, no, because. But we all know Janet is never one to give up an idea easily. So Linda takes out her camera. Oh, just for you, Janet. One more time. And what do you know? So it is scrollable. Apparently, fantastic. Okay, okay. But if we're going to do this, we really need to know exactly what we're doing. We don't want to end up in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or. Inside the back wall of some, I don't know, bakery. Death by baguette could be worse. Seconds later, Janet has already brought up Google Earth on her phone. Saint John's, Antigua. Got it. I'd best put us down somewhere that definitely would have been undeveloped back then. Here we are on a hilltop, Mount Thomas, seventeen degrees six minutes forty nine point eight six seconds by sixty one degrees fifty two minutes fifty nine point seven five seconds. Does that mean we're going to have to walk through the jungle to get to town? Honestly, Linda, there are wardrobe considerations. I start rummaging through a drawer looking for shorts and t-shirts. Um, what year should we pick? Let me see. Robert Coates is back in Antigua by 1788 for sure. We already know he's joined the local theater group by this time. But wait a second. Listen to this. Lord Nelson makes a brief stop in Antigua in 1805. The Lord Nelson? Yeah, the one-armed, one-eyed hero of the seas. We just saw his statue back in London. So, what do you say, guys? July 1805. I hold up my T-shirt. 
and blazoned on it is a picture of three colorful palm trees plus the words, One Love, Jamaica. Why not, I think? But Janet clamps her hands firmly on her hips. Seriously? 